And uh, yeah, thank okay. you. All right, so we've just done some basic things there. Uh, simple arithmetic, variables, the kind of ground ground level stuff. Um, but that's not really programming as such. That's just messing about with types. Uh, you really start programming when you deal with functions. Right? Functions are like one of the core computational units. And as luck would have it, JavaScript supports functions. Uh, so that's useful. And the syntax for declaring them is a little bit different from what you've maybe seen in some other languages. But it's, it's fairly simple and quite rational in its way. So if I wanted to create a function to square things, uh, what, there are actually multiple ways of doing it, turns out. But one way that I'm going to introduce is I'm going to create a thing called square which it will implicitly declare for me, because I'm assigning it. And I want to say that square is a function. So I say function. And it's a function that takes as its parameter a single uh, variable x. OK, just standard stuff. And then as its output, and this is where I have to remember that curly braces on an Icelandic keyboard means pressing alt. Yep. Uh, so we get curly brackets mode for the function body, as usual. And I tell it to return x times x and I'll put a semicolon on just for completeness even though it would let me it would let me get away with it and close out the curly brackets and that's it and that's me kind of defining a function um, and notice it's, it's a simple assignment you know it's a bit like the same way I would say you know hello equals 99 like 99 is a value that JavaScript understands and hello is a variable that is a label on that value same thing's happening here square is just a variable that we've made but instead of it having a value of a string or a number, its value is a function. And we just created that function out of thin air. This is like a, a sort of dynamically created function. We just built one. We told it, create a little function box somewhere that takes an x and returns x times x. And I'm going to call that square. OK, and that's what you've got. Uh, and then if you say, well, what is square? You kind of saw it above. Square is a function. So the, the, this is a little bit different to languages like C, for example where you don't really create functions on the fly like this. Um, and functions aren't, you know, obviously the language has got functions in them, but the, the, the function isn't like a first class data type. It's actually a special compile time entity that doesn't really exist at runtime in the normal way. Uh, but JavaScript's different. Uh, you know, this square reference to the function is just as real as any other um, data type in the language. With the notable exception that unlike other data types, you can call functions. And of course, you call them in the standard way, as in you pass in an argument and you put that in parentheses. So if I say square three, now we've gone from saying, you know, what is the value of the, the variable square, which is a function, to take that function and put three into it and tell me what the answer would be, which of course would be. I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's okay to say things like that, you know, they're not all tricks. And I would like to think you're at the level where you know what the square of three is. I'm hoping that you're that good. Yes, yeah, so square three is nine. I mean, there will be tricks from time to time, make no doubt, but that's part of the fun, right? Uh, and it generalizes. You, you can square other numbers. What's square of four? There we go. Uh, what square of I forgot to put anything in? Did the, what? Nan. Nan, well done. Yeah, it is Nan. So th how many of you know about Nan? Yeah, okay. Nan, not a number. Again, it's part of the standard floating point specification. There's a, there's a way to say that you've got a floating point number that doesn't really represent a proper number, like maybe you divided by zero or you did something else that was kind of strange. And these, this exists in, in all the languages that do floating point math, but most of them hide it so it doesn't often come to the surface. In JavaScript, it comes to the surface all the damn time. Uh, so you'll often see nans being thrown around when you forget. So what's happened here is I've called a function that wanted to have a single parameter and didn't give it one. In a compiled language, this would be a compilation error. If it did it in C or something, or Java, it would say, you know, syntax error, you're calling a function, you haven't put the arguments in. But JavaScript's dynamic. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of responding to what you're doing as you're doing it. So it just goes and tries to run the function anyway. And it sort of knows you've made a mistake, but it can't do much about it. It's like, what's it going to do? You know, it's, uh, imagine this is on a running web page. Do you want the web page to just like crash? You want the web page to say, you know, obscure compiler error that a person looking at a web page is not going to understand? No. So one of the things that the reason that one of the reasons that JavaScript is so permissive and sometimes so silly is that it's trying to not surface very esoteric errors of the kind that an ordinary web page user wouldn't know how to understand. So what happens in JavaScript is if you 
if you call a function and you don't supply all the arguments, they have a default value. And the default value is this undefined value that's just what things mean before you've, before you've assigned them to anything. You can also predefine. Yes, you can. Uh, but in this case, it's an undefined value, and it tries to do arithmetic on a thing that's not a number, uh, so it fails. And it, that bubbles up, and the result is this NAND value. So that's what happens when you do it the wrong way. And there are sort of equivalent things that would happen if you pass them uh, the wrong number of, of arguments. Like if I did that, uh, what do you think the answer to that's going to be? 25. Okay, anyone think it's not 25? Do anyone think it'll maybe be 25, 36, 49, uh, 64? Anyone think it'll be that? No, nah, nobody, nobody falling for that one. First one is right, it's 25. Again, you passed it more arguments than it knows what to do with. But it hasn't got a really good way of explaining that to you. Again, if you imagine this being, uh, this is inside a web page that somebody's looking at. So it just takes the first one, five, which it can match against X, and says, well, there you go. And the others, it just throws them away. Um, so JavaScript is full of things like this, things that would be compilation errors in a more static language. It can't really express a compilation error because, in a certain sense, there is no compiler. Now, actually, it is sort of a compiler, but originally JavaScript was an interpreted language, so there, there was no compiler to do the compile checking, kind of. Um, so you get these weird things where it, it, it's very permissive. It lets you do kind of silly nonsense, and it just has to have some kind of policy. And the policy here is, in a way, it's kind of the obvious one. It'll just The variables that, that it can give values to, it gives values to, and the ones that it can't give values to, it keeps them as undefined. And that's just how it works. Um, now, we point out that square here is just an ordinary variable. It's just a variable that happens to be mapped to a function right now. Uh, that means you can do things like this. We can say time self is a new variable is equal to square. And what I've done here is I'm doing an assignment, just like when I did greet equals hello, that kind of thing. I'm assigning a variable that happens to be a function to another variable. And now time self is just another name for the same function. We've now got, again, two labels pointing to the same thing. So if I do time self 9, it's 81. Right? So I've just aliased the function. So the same function, it's got multiple names because they're all just pointing at the same guy. Right, here's a little mystery for you. Mystery is equal to function a comma b curly brackets bum 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 a plus b semicolon and there we go, we've got a function that takes uh, two parameters this time and uh, would be appearing to uh, trying to add them up. So let's try this difficult question and see if anybody's willing to play along. Mystery 1, 2, what's the answer? Yeah. Ah, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened there? Why is, it, why is it not 3? Which is what you would expect. It, it was, I mean, that was definitely a trap. No return statement, right? I just I forgot to put the return on it. Now, what would a sensible language have done? A sensible language would have said, you forgot to put in the return statement. Now, you've written a function, you obviously need to return something. That's what functions are for. Uh, it would say, compile error, missing return. What does JavaScript do? doesn't do that. <laughs> Again, it doesn't want to show you error messages. It tries to just make the best of, best of things, the uh, best of the situation. Um, so it goes and runs the function, which does a bunch of calculations. There is no return statement. So it just ignores everything that you did and says the answer is undefined. Because that's JavaScript. Again, you know, it's kind of annoying from a certain point of view, but once you accept this mentality of the language is dynamic, it doesn't want to give you error messages, it just has fallbacks for when things go wrong. The fallback here is that you didn't you didn't say return, so there's it's undefined. Um, so I could fix that now. I've got you can do history editing luckily on these uh, things. So I'll put the return in. And if I do that, then mystery one or two is indeed three, as any sane person would have expected. Uh, also, I did this as a one-liner, but um, just in case you're ever doing this yourself, um, when you declare these things, if you press Shift and Enter, you can get a new line without finishing the whole statement. So you can do that to break up over multiple lines. I can put a tab in over here. Shift enter, and that's maybe a bit more the way you'd. Uh, oops, did I just? Uh, I went down too far and it deleted it. But you get the idea. You can you can break up over lines if you really want to. I'll try it once more. Uh, this is 
I'm just reaching the bottom of the screen. It's been a pain. I won't bother, but you can do it if you want to. Um, just so you know. Um, so that's um. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's more to say about functions, but I'll leave it at that for just a second because I want to show you something else. Um, no, no. Tell a lie. I'm going to. I keep jumping back and forth here. Um, there's a there are a couple of different ways of defining functions in JavaScript. Um, in fact, uh, how many of you know about ES6? Yeah. So do you know about arrow functions? Yeah. yeah. So I'm not going to show you those, but they're a, they're a convenient shorthand. Uh, I'm using the more explicit kind of old-fashioned uh, methods. But one thing I want to point out to you is that the way I defined the function here is I just assigned it directly using a, an equal statement. Um, that is what's called a function expression. So I'll, I'll just duplicate myself so you can see it side by side here. So, uh, by the way, I'm putting a space after the word function, but you don't have to. I just it sometimes looks a little bit neater, but actually in real code I often don't. In real code I, I would often just do it like that, but I don't care. Um, function x. Mm -mm -mm. No, that's not the right thing. Turn x times x. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so that's the way we've been doing it up till now. That is, it's called a function expression because this thing over here is an expression just in the same way that, you know, 4 plus 3 is or the string hello. It's just a value in the language and then you assign it to a thing. But there's another way of doing it, which is a bit more conventional. This is the way functions have declared in a lot of other languages where you just say function and you treat function as a keyword and you put the name in here in front of the, uh, the argument. That's a bit more classical, sort of traditional style. Uh, which you can do as well. Return x times x, like uh, like that. Um, now that says undefined, but that's just because when you use function as a statement, the statement itself doesn't return a value. It's just one of these kind of quirks. But the point is that SQ2 itself was defined and is indeed a function, just in the same way that SQ1 was. Oops. Uh -huh. Yeah. OK, so it's sort of the same. There's some interesting differences, though, and that's to do with uh, whether functions know what their name is. If you take SQ2, which I defined using the uh, statement style, it turns out it's got a property on it. And just like most object languages, you access properties when you adopt. And that's you talking to the inside of the object. You say SQ2 name it actually tells you it's called SQ2 because it was kind of christened with a, with a name up here. Whereas if you take old SQ1, Remember, SQ1 is just a variable that we created that happens to point to a function. But the function itself was created by a bare function expression that didn't have a name. So I'm kind of giving away the punchline. SQ1 name. God damn it. <laughs> they changed this. This is really annoying. Um, I'm going to have to fix that. So it used to be that if you did this, uh, if you used the expression style, you would get an empty string. Um, and this must, I think this is maybe an ES6 change or something, or it's the console being super clever. I'm going to have to double check this. It used to be the case that if you took a function expression and asked its name, it wouldn't, it, the, it wouldn't have a name, uh, but they've changed it. God damn it. Okay, so note to self, I need to get that fixed. I did, I tried to do a dry run of this, but I must have missed that one. Okay, not to worry. So uh, we're all learning. I've learned something. Um, okay, I've got another example here. Yeah, I can, yeah, okay, just for the hell of it. Well, we're playing with variations on naming things. So this is where I'm going to take, it looks like I'm, uh, this is a, another sort of function expression one, like the first style, but I'm actually going to give it a name in here, like that. Um, boom, boom, boom. Now, of course, I've totally lost faith in myself now, so even I don't know what the answer is going to be now. Uh, so uh, what will sq3.name be? Don't cheat by typing it in. Uh, I'm going to guess that uh, it is going to pick up name, I think. Yeah. And that's name, the string name. So what's happened here is that when we christened the function as an expression here, we created a function that actually did have a name. It's called name. And SQ3 happens to know that. The tricky one is when we did it up here, they've changed the standard so that it seems to have, like, it's put SQ1 in here for me as if it's kind of cheated and it kind of knew what name the variable was and it's put that in which is nasty, but they're, they're trying to make it consistent, you see. So uh, there you go. 
Um, okay. Right, that's enough function stuff for just now. Let's look at uh, another thing you need to know about, um, which is arrays. So arrays in JavaScript are um, very interesting. <laughs> let's just let's just say that and uh, and, and see what happens. Uh, so this is how you declare an array. It's the square brackets notation, quite common. So if I do this, what I'm doing is I'm saying a is a variable, and the value that it has is an empty array. Uh, and there you go, an empty array. Arrays have got properties that are relevant, such as length. So again, you can just ask the array what is its length. Now, note this is not a function. I'm not saying I'm not calling the length function on a. I'm simply asking it for its property. A bit like you can say, you know, function dot name. You're saying what is your name? I'm saying what is your length? And what is what is a's length? Zero. Zero. Right. Easy. Um, okay. So that was that one. But now I'm going to create a new array that's actually got something in it. Uh, God's sake. No. Uh, always, it always takes me a while to get used to the Icelandic keyboard. <clears throat> right. We'll take an array and we'll put some fruit in it. <coughs> like that. Okay. And when we do the assignment, it just echoes out the value. That's a bit like when you just, you know, if you did like a, a string assignment, it would echo out the string. Same sort of thing. There's this little thing that the console does where when it writes out an array, it kind of shows you its value at that and it gives you a little uh, chevron you can click on where you can actually expand it and you can see the contents. So that's quite nice. You can see that it's got three elements, numbered 0, 1, and 2. The length is 3. And it's got some magic down here that we can ignore for now. So that's how you assign an array to something non-trivial. Uh, and as we saw above, A's length is in fact 3. It magically knows, you know, it, it knows when you constructed it that it had three things in it. So it just it just keeps a track of how many elements it's got. That's how it works. And you can index them in what you would, uh, I think, would be the kind of obvious way. You put the numbers in the square brackets. So one, two, uh, zero, one, two. Uh, what's this one going to be? Anybody else? Any other suggestions? No. No, it could be none. It could could be anything, right? Um, it it sort of it kind of the most consistent thing the JavaScript would do based on what we've seen so far is it would say undefined, and that's what it actually does. So you've run off the end of the array, um, which in C could be like your program would crash, right? Because you've you've run off the end of an array, you've accessed memory that you don't own. Theoretically, that might crash your program, or it might not. Uh, but sometimes it might. But JavaScript will say it, it can detect that you've exceeded the array bounds, and it just catches that, and it returns undefined. <clears throat> uh, let's go back to the array, and I'm going to set element 1 to be 99. Uh, now what is A? Well, I'll just let you see it. It's that. So this is kind of interesting, right? Because this started off as an array of strings, and now it's an array of uh, strings and a number. So again, a statically typed language, you have to when you get an array, you have to declare what it's an array of, and that's because it's like a regular grid in memory. So it needs to know the size of all the things, so the type system knows what they're all for, so it knows what it can do with them. So you have arrays of numbers, arrays of strings, arrays of whatever. Um, but JavaScript has got uh, what are called the heterogeneous arrays. So it can be an array of anything. It turns out you can mix and match the types within an array, which can be a convenience sometimes and a complete bother at other times, because you might have a thing that you intend it to be an array of numbers, and some bug in your program, some obscure function, accidentally copies a string into your array somewhere, and then somewhere over here you're processing it and trying to add them all up, uh, and one of the things you're adding up is a string and not a number, and all sorts of shit will happen, right? So you don't get the type checking that you get in a statically typed language. But you get the flexibility, because sometimes you're in a statically typed language, and you'd like to have an array of a bunch of different things. You, know, you don't have a bunch of things that don't have a common type, and you can't do it in those languages. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. Um, dum -dum -dum -dum. Now, here's another thing. So, so we've said that A is indeed the array Apple 99 Cherry. And we know that in JavaScript, the way you compare things is by using triple equals to be uh, sensible. So I'll just see if this array matches the array Apple 99 Cherry. What do you think we're going to get? 
Yeah, because it, this one sounds like a trap, doesn't it? I mean, why would I, why would I do this if it gave you the obvious answer? Uh, the answer's false. And that is because, it's actually what the guy at the front mentioned, um, that uh, what you're doing here is you're doing a direct, you're kind of doing a memory comparison with arrays. When you compare two arrays with the exact comparison, you're saying, are they the same or exact same array in memory? It means it's like, you know, you, you create an array here. Is it, are, are they, have you got two variables that are both pointing to the same thing? If you create another array that happens to have the same contents, but is in a different part of the memory, it's a different different thing in memory, they're not the same. Now, that sounds really annoying and stupid, but the thing is, if it wasn't that way, when you compared arrays, the system would have to walk down both arrays and check element by element whether they're the same, which could get really slow. Imagine a big array with like a million things in it. When you did the comparison, it would have to go and do a element by element comparison. And the decision has been to not do that. The decision is when you compare an arrays, you're saying, are they exactly the same thing? Uh, so that's, uh, that's how it works. Uh, which is why, if you compare A to itself, it will say yes, because it's the same thing. And if I create a new one called B, a new variable B, and I set it to A, now we've got you know one label B that's pointed to the same thing that A pointed to. So in that case, if I now compare them, uh, well, stop getting the wrong key. Um, they're, the, they're the same thing, so the comparison will succeed. Uh, okay, so let's just have a little reminder of what our current state of A is, and then I'm going to do. So we've got three elements: zero, one, and two. Uh, what if I try and suddenly decide that I want to have an element five, and I want that to be a pair? What if I... So, uh, like again. Most languages, this would be an error, right? It'd be, you know, dimension out of range. Um, but we know that JavaScript's not that kind of language. JavaScript is going to try and do its best here. So what do you think it's going to do? Number three and four that we have the height, and we check what's going to check. Correct. That's exactly what it does. So now if I look at A, um, it's uh, one, two, three, skip a few, pair. <laughs> um, which, you know, crazy as it seems, it is sort of rational in the sense that I told I wanted element number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to be pair. Um, these things here, they're not just, you know, there's nothing there. Uh, so it, it fills them up with empty space, sort of. It doesn't actually fill them up with anything. It's even weirder. But that's what, that's what happens. It just uh, it creates a hole in the array. Again, this is annoying sometimes, but another time this is good. This is what's called a sparse array. You can create arrays that have got holes in them. So you can have a, an array that's maybe got like you know a million different indices to it, but imagine if you only use a couple of them. You know you've got a couple of low indices down here and a couple of super high ones up here. It turns out it doesn't store a million elements. It only stores the ones that have got real content, and it just knows that the bit in the middle is empty. Um, it's it's sort of efficient almost, even though it's not what you usually expect from arrays, but it's the way JavaScript does them. Uh, so now if I was to say and it's almost hinted at above. Let's see, what is the length of this array, right? Now, it's got four meaningful elements in it, but uh, but what's its length? Six. Its length is six, right? Because it's got six potential slots, with number five being the highest one. So, indeed, its length is six. This is all a little bit strange. This is not exactly how you'd expect an array to behave in most languages. And there's a reason why it's not the way you'd expect an array to behave in most languages. What is type of A? Object. Stop cheating. <laughs> uh, I mean, you're allowed to be right. Yeah, it's object. It's not an array, right? Well, isn't Java like that as well, actually? In hmm? reality. What? Isn't Java like that as well? I, you know, I actually don't. It's been a long time since I've done Java. Um, everything in Java oh, yeah, is an object. It, right? Ultimately, it's an object. Yeah, but I don't know whether it does weird type punning on arrays. It's not something I've ever looked at. I've, I've never used Java seriously. I, I skipped the Java era. I went from a C, C++ to Python, if anything, Python and JavaScript. Um, but the stupid thing about this is there's an actual object as well if you use curly braces. Yes, that's true. Although I don't think that's entirely stupid. Well, uh, it, it's the, so, the, so it, it's quite complicated. This one of the answers is that JavaScript doesn't really have arrays, right? It's kidding you on. It's pretending to have arrays. What it's got is objects, but it just turns out that if you use the square bracket notation, it creates an object, and we'll get to what objects are. In fact, more on Wednesday, uh, objects are what they, they are in an object-oriented language, right? They're the, they're the totally general thing. Basically, 
what happened was, I'm sure this must be the case, that Brendan Knight implemented objects first, knowing that he'd need them, and realised if you've got a general object system, which is a, just a way of creating um, associations between you know, member attributes and values, it turns out you kind of get a raise for free if you just say that the names are 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, right? So it's like a, it's member name lookup with numbers. Uh, so the arrays are kind of a joke in JavaScript. They're actually objects under the hood um, with some kind of slightly quirky behavior. They're, they're very similar to what you'd call like a dictionary in another language. They're lookup tables. They're just lookup tables where the thing, your, your, key, is a, your key is an integer. Mm, no, a number. The key is a number and the value is whatever you put in it. So arrays are very eccentric in JavaScript. They're, they're not what you would expect up to including they're not even arrays. They are, they are literally objects. Ah, uh, well, um, certainly it's important for arrays to have iterability. You, you can iterate through objects now as well, though you can do the for for of and for in to yeah. iterate through the keys. But yeah, there's there's a, there's a, there's a quirkiness there to that. Yes. Whereas with with arrays, it's important that they be iterable in a, a very kind of understandable way. Uh, but we'll we'll get to all that. All right. So that's enough of arrays for now. Although we might return to them. Uh, let's just go back briefly to strings. Uh, I have a reason. So we played with strings before, nice and simple. But now I'm going to use the uh, array notation on a string, treating it as if it were an array, and say, if it was an array, what would element one be? What would it be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it works. Right? So um, you can use this array-like notation with strings to pull out individual letters, which you can do in lots of languages. Uh, so here's another. Variant of that, we'll create a little string S, and we'll look at element. Uh -huh, we'll look at element three of that, which is zero, one, two, three. The little L. Yep, yeah, there we go. Um, now, if I was to take element three, because remember we took that array that we created and we changed the array from from apple to or for banana to ninety nine or something, right? Let's try the same trick here. Let's take this the string character three that was an L. And let's set it to E instead. Right? Ah, that was a typo on my part. Uh, that's what I meant to do. Okay. So that seems fine. So what's the value of string now where we change the L to an E? Same. Yes. So that I think is, is sort of particularly quirky in that it allowed me to do the, the assignment. The assignment itself wasn't an error. This was a typo. That's unrelated, right? It let me do the assignment. It told me that it produced a result, and it didn't bloody well change anything. It just downright ignored it. But it kind of had to, because it turns out like a lot of languages, a lot of modern ones anyway, strings are immutable in JavaScript. Once you've created a string, it, it stays the way it is. And part of the reason for that is so that this thing about uh, doing string assignments works, that if you have lots of variables all point to the same string, you don't want one person to really mutate the string in a way that will affect everybody else. Um, I mean, you know, a language designer has to decide whether to do it that way or not, but it's quite common now that strings are seen as immutable types. Um, in the same way that if you've got, you know, the, the number 23, you can't change the number 23 to make it anything else. You can do things with it, you can add one to it, and that'll create a new number that's 24, but 23 will never change its value. Its value is 23. It's sort of the same with strings. Once you've created a string, it's frozen, and it turns out there are, like, that can be there are efficiency reasons why it's good to do it that way. It helps with various things, uh, but the consequence is if you have yourself writing code where you think you're, you're you're mutating a string, it actually won't work. So don't do it. It's a waste of time. Uh, there you go. Uh, more fun with strings. Hello. Every one. So I've got a string, oops, I meant to put a plus there, no mistake, string, and a string, and a number. What's that going to do? So that's what it does. Now this is always going to be a hard call, right? Because as I said at the start, plus is an arithmetic operator normally, so it's for doing arithmetic with numbers, but we've allowed ourselves to do it with strings, and we've said that if you do it with strings, it concatenates them, so hello plus, plus every just joins the two strings together, makes a new string. It's the two stuck together. You take a string and you add a number to it. I mean, what do you do? And 
JavaScript's decision is, I'm going to change the number into a string, and then I'm going to concatenate the strings. So that's what happens. At least that's what happens sometimes. So with that in mind, what happens if I do 1 plus 2 plus 3? Oh, God, I'm never going to over. Uh, let's do plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6, just to have maximum fun. So this will be mixing and matching uh, numbers and strings. What do you think? That's going to be the string 3, 3, 4, 5, 6. 3, 3, 4, 5, 6. I think you're right. Because what's going to happen here is the first part of it does 1 plus 2. It doesn't know you've got a bunch of string nonsense coming yet. It thinks, oh, 1 plus 2, that's 3. No problem. Then you've got 3 plus 3. And it says, ah, well, I can't add 3 in 3 uh, because 3 is a string. So I have to turn the first 3 into a string as well. And then when I do that, I get 33 or 3, 3. Uh, and then it just kind of cascades that way. So you end up with this rather peculiar result which is what happens when you do a mixing and matching of types. And if we just want to add a bit more uh, chaos to the mix, um, and uh, now, what should I say here? Uh, I'm going to ask you to not answer, just because because, because that's why. Uh, what's going to happen? There. Nah, well, you know, it's just, just give, give other people a chance. Um, what happens if instead of adding six at the end, I subtract it? It comes to the number of So you think at the end it's going to try and do arithmetic at the last stage because that's just how crazy this language is. And that, that would be quite crazy. How, on a scale of like 0 to A, how crazy would it be if it did that? It's quite crazy. But, I mean, it could, it could be. It's even worse. <laughs> yep. So what's going on there? <laughs> It cut up the string six. It subtracted six from three, three, four, five. Oh, oh. Okay. Oh. 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 Let's just not do that, okay? <laughs> Don't try and do arithmetic on strings. <laughs> All right, and that uh, for the for for the for the moment is uh, is the last JavaScript horror I will inflict on you. Um, but all this was foundational stuff. Uh, some of this stuff, you know, a lot of you think like, you know JavaScript, but you maybe don't know these little quirks, which turn out to matter when you're dealing with fine details. What um, does it do if you do times? Oh God! Do, actually, I, think, I have an idea as to what it might do, but we'll. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes the best way is just to do it and see what happens, right? Oh, I know what happens. <laughs> uh, it reached a certain point where I, I just I just don't want to think about it anymore. Um, but anyway, the reason I'm telling you these things is uh, is because these are some foundational things that you'll need to do the homework this week. Because we've, we've got to that stage. We're going to have homework this week. Um, I'm going to set an exercise for you to do a couple, couple of ultimately simple programming exercises. Which are really just to check that you've got the basic syntax down. You know, it's just writing simple functions, a couple of simple loops, if statements, and basic, you know, arithmetic and type manipulations of the kind that we've covered here. So what I've done now is I think I've told you all the stuff you need to know to be able to do the homework correctly. Um, so now I'm going to show you how to actually uh, how we're going to be doing the homework. We're going to be using a, a thing called JS Fiddle. Does anyone know JS Fiddle? Yeah. It makes it a little bit easier to do this kind of stuff. So I'm going to switch back to the main notes now, which I've been going through um, in this uh, interactive form, and I'll show you. I'll show you the rest of it. Uh, okay. All right. So, so all these things that I went through, they're actually in the slides. So when you come to uh, revising it, you can see them. Um, this is basically just what we ran through there. Um, I need to correct that one about the name. That's really annoying. Um, Okay, so JS Fiddle is a website you can go to that makes it quite easy to experiment with JavaScript code. What I like about it is it allows you to write the JavaScript in one column and have the results of executing it appear in another column side by side, which is just kind of convenient to work with. Uh, so I've got a couple of tabs open here for that. Um, here we go. So this is what JS Fiddle looks like if you just bring it up on its own. 
It's got four tabs, one where you put your HTML code, and we'll sometimes have a little bit of code in there, but not much. CSS, which you won't be using. A block of JavaScript code that gets executed in this context, and a result pane where you spit out the answers. And as an example of how this behaves, uh, I've got a little uh, version of it here that I, I created for you. Um, we've got no actual HTML here yet. I've um, just got a bunch of simple pieces of code that are writing things out. So there's a standard object in the JavaScript uh, dev tools called console, uh, where you can, uh, you can send little strings and stuff to it and write them out. So if I run this code, uh, we'll actually, we won't see anything obvious here. We won't see anything in this pane. But if I've got the right, uh, if I've got the right version of the console thing, I might need to open up a new one on this uh, on this window. Uh, tools, there we go. Yeah, here we go. So we get a bit more spam here because there's some background stuff on that web page that's causing warnings and stuff. But you'll see that in this console, we've got four hello twenty five thirty six, right? And that was a result of these messages being executed. Four, hello, I created a square function, I did square of five, and I did square of six as well. Right? Um, now you can see that most of the way through here, what I was doing was console.log to write these things out, but I got bored of doing that, so I created a function to save me a couple of keystrokes. I created a little function called out that just takes a single parameter and sends it to console.log. So down here, I just said out instead of console.log. Slightly more convenient. But this is still not very good because it writes them out to the console window that I have to go over here and look at, and it's got kind of noise in it as well, so it's not very clean. So I wanted to do something better than that. Um, JS Fiddle allows you to have versions of a... When you create a Fiddle, it gives you like its own unique little meaningless URL, and then you can have um, versions, like very simple version control. So this is actually version 1 in this URL. That's actually, that's, oh, no, I must, sorry, I tell a lie, I think it must have been to start with zero. Yeah, so that was version zero, which is one I just showed you. Um, and then I've got version one, which I edited to add a little bit to it. You can see it's sort of the same idea, but the uh, my out function, I changed it a little bit. Just drag this across here. So not only did I write it out to the console, I also took the document, which is how, you know, it's a, the, the DOM object, you probably know all that because you've done your web stuff on it. I go and find an element called output, which is this thing up here in the HTML. Okay? If anyone doesn't understand this, let me know and I can elaborate. But the principle is, I've created some HTML where there's a, a little div element called output, and then I've told the JavaScript code to go and find that part of the web page that's called output, and go to the HTML inside it, and add whatever the thing was that I told it to print. So now, when I do out down here, I actually see it coming out on the web page. This, if you imagine this being like the web page that would be generated from this code. Okay, so that's slightly more convenient having to keep looking at the console window. And if I go up to version two, um, I've, this is me just making the output function fancy, right? So now I've made the output function support multiple arguments. Now, some of you might know there are better ways of doing this now with uh, the rest and spread thing in ES6. When I first wrote this, the ES6 standard hadn't been properly finalized and not all the browsers not all browsers supported it correctly. So I've written most of this code ES5 style, which is sometimes a little bit uglier. But it doesn't matter because it's just it's just kind of uh, support framework stuff, right? So what I've done here is I've taken an out function. I've uh, this is the way that you would would extract an arbitrary list of arguments if you've got more than one argument passed into a function. It's a variable argument system. Um, and I then iterate through the arguments with a for loop, uh, just doing a bunch of kind of simple string manipulation to join them all together. And then I write that out to the inner element. You don't really have to worry about this. It, uh, I'm just providing this as a utility function for you. The point of it is that it means when I get to the bottom, you can write things like out and you can put multiple parameters of different types, you know, a string and a number and a string and the output of a function, and it'll just write them out. So this is all to help you. This is so that when you're doing your, your homework exercise, if you want to debug it while you're going through it, you can just type out bracket and then some value that you're interested in, and you get kind of like the world's shittest debugger, where it will just write that value out so you can at least see what, what the intermediate value was if you're trying to work out why your function isn't doing what you want. 
Uh, I think version 3, I added a little bit more to it to make it handle uh, arrays. Uh, yeah, so you can see now that, again, slightly more complicated, I ended up resorting to doing kind of JSON nonsense, which you can you can look at this if you care, but I, you know, don't, don't sweat it, it's not important. The point is simply that the utility function at the end here now means that it can print out numbers and arrays and even objects. This is this is the, the notation for an object in curly brackets, but I don't we don't need that today, but we'll need it soon. And again, you just get it over here. Right? So the end result of this is that you've got a simple little thing in JS Fiddle, um, and you can write a bunch of code, and you can see the output of your code over here. So it's kind of a super simple online IDE, and uh, and you can use this yourself. It'll start off like this when it's blank. You type stuff in. When you've got something you want to save, you click save, and it'll save that version and give you a new version number for the next one. And you, you just keep doing this. You can save a couple of uh, ongoing versions of something you're working on. So that's basically the idea there. Uh, if you're doing this, though, do be careful to uh, save your results frequently. And although it's got a built-in save system, um, you can sometimes get problems, especially early on, if you accidentally write code that's got an infinite loop in it or something like that, that when you run it, you'll hang up that browser tab because, you know, you're just in a, a loop that never terminates. Um, and if you haven't already saved it, then you'll have lost that part of your work. So I would suggest that when you're working on this, in addition to using the built-in features, you also occasionally press Control A to take the whole text and then Control C to copy it and then just paste this into like a text file or something just so you've always got like your own local backup of your latest work so you don't lose it if something screws up or if the if the site goes down, which it you know, might do from time to time. So just I'm just warning you there to not over-invest in this and not be totally dependent on it doing all the saving for you because if it goes wrong, you'll, you'll, you'll be hurt. Luckily, this exercise isn't very large, so you won't lose much, but better if you didn't lose anything, right? So just remember to save as you go. Uh, make your own backup. Okay, and that's it. Uh, although there's more to come on Wednesday, I have now told you enough about JavaScript to let you do the homework. So you know, you know, you know JS foo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> show me. Yeah, show me. You're Neo, I'm Morpheus. I know Morpheus is a dick, but <laughs> I want you to show me that you know what you can do. Oh, you can't. You shouldn't leave yet, by the way. Uh, is this the end of the time slot? Um, I, I do have a bit more to say. If some of you really have to go, then okay, do it now, but let me try and finish this off. There's, there's some stuff I need to say. Um, okay. Um, so you should know enough to do this now. Use GS Fiddle, work through some exercises. I've got the instructions here. Now I will try and put these up as a proper assignment on the uh, the Canvas system, the annoyingly named Canvas system, um, or you could follow this link. I'll try and get that sorted as soon as I can, but I haven't done it yet because I don't know how to use that system. But if you just follow the embedded link from here, you should get the same thing anyway. Uh, it's, uh, this is it, right? There's some instructions here. Now you have to be careful about, I'm actually going to run you through this because uh, sometimes people get confused about what the instructions are saying. This is the basic template that I want you to work to. And what I'm telling you is, create a fresh JS fiddle, take this part here, which is your HTML code, because we need an output element, and you put that in there, like that. And then this part in here, from use strict down, is the, uh, the basic kind of framework of the exercise, down to here, right, not all the way at the end, it's that part of it. So copy that, and that goes into the JavaScript section, like so. The last part of it is this helper function that helps you do the uh, output printing, right? And uh, just widen this a little bit. Um, and then you can read through here, and it'll tell you what you're supposed to do, right? Basically, there's a bunch of functions in here. They're, uh, I've given you them empty, right? And I just you fill them in. So you actually have to like implement these things. So I'm telling you how much they're worth, what they're supposed to do, giving you sort of an example of uh, what the correct output ought to look like. So your job is to fill in the code and return the correct answer. Now, the marking for this will be largely automated, so it's important that you do it just right. For example, don't do things like changing the names of the functions or anything like that. 
just, just fill in the gaps, just fill in the bodies of the functions, because there's a test harness that will call these functions with test data and check that you produce the right answers. So you need to kind of play by the rules there. Um, Okay, and once you've done, once you've set up this template, you can do, you know, you, you save the fiddle. I'm not going to do it now because I don't want to spam up the uh, the contents here. But you'll save it. You'll get a URL, and when you submit the exercise, you should you should submit your URL with whatever suffix you end up with. You know, it might be blah 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 slash nine if it was like your ninth iteration that you saved, and that's what you post on the uh, the homework site. Um, okay. But just doing what I just said would be a little bit too easy because if you look at those examples, they're very trivial. You know, like work out the median, work out the large, the two things, really easy stuff. Um, so there's an additional restriction. This is the uh, do it with one hand behind your back uh, restriction, right? Um, so you're not allowed to use the standard library. So you're not allowed to use like, the built-in math functions. Um, there are a couple of things like uh, you know, there's a built-in string reverser, uh, but I don't want to use that one. I want you to write your own, okay? So the rule is. Um, that all the functions that you write, uh, all the functions that you use have to be ones that you've written. You can't, as I say, you can't lean on standard library functions just because it would make it all too easy, right? Uh, I just want you to show that you can do it yourself, uh, and that's just the, the most practical way of doing that. Um, but you should know enough to do it, um, and when we're uh, at the tutorial on Wednesday, what would be nice is, you know, as soon as I get this information sent out to you, maybe start trying to look at it early. Uh, that way, on Wednesday, if you've hit any problems uh, in the tutorial session, I can help you with them directly and get you some progress so you don't get stuck on it. You'll have a week to do it. The general policy is I'll put out the homework at the end of the Monday lectures, and your deadline will be the start of the next Monday's lectures. So that gives you a week to do it, but by having it be the start of the next lecture also means that I can give away the answers uh, a week down the line without it screwing everything up. Uh, and then you'll get your marks as soon after that as we can, depending on how long it takes me and the TA to, to get through the marking. Okay. Um, do read the instructions carefully. There are annoying, pedantic little details in the homework, and if you don't pay attention to them, you'll get marked down. Um, stick with the function names. Also, some of you might know about things like the for in loop. Um, don't use it. It will actually be wrong for this exercise. Just use an old-fashioned for, you know, for equals zero, less than n, plus plus, the conventional style of for loop, um, because as someone pointed out, for n doesn't have guaranteed iteration order, which means it, it might look as if it works, but it, it is, will something produce wrong answers and it'll actually fail the marking script. So don't try and be too clever. Just use the stuff I've taught you. Uh, the things I've taught you are, are sufficient to get through this. Okay, I think that is indeed all you need to know for this one. I'll try and get that information out to you. Once I send out the notes, you can you can get the homework link on the notes, but I'll also try and put it into the assignment system once I figured out how to do it. And uh, I'll see you on Wednesday.